Democracy and Dictatorship, presented by Shkoda. Simply clever. Hello everyone, I'm Rohit Gandhi and you're watching Democracy and Dictatorship. On today's episode, we're going to be looking at the right to water. Doctors and health guides will tell you that drink seven to eight glasses of water a day. That's great. But what do you do when that water is contaminated? Or if your access to clean drinking water is limited or sometimes impossible? What if the food you eat is toxic because the water it grew from is polluted or poisoned. These are the challenges that a large number of people across the globe face. 663 million still don't get safe drinking water. And water scarcity affects more than 40% of the global population. In South Asia, many countries are dependent on their neighbors for water, for irrigation and other purposes. Our correspondent, Shailaja Verma, takes a look at the factors that lead to deprivation of water in the subcontinent and the conflicts that have arisen over water sharing. In absolute terms, right to water gives a person access to quality water between 55 to 70 litres each day. But no South Asian country has prioritised water in their policies. In India, water is seen as a realm within the right to life. But policy wrongs see this as vague and disturbing. India, China, Nepal, Bangladesh and Pakistan alone account for nearly half the world's total groundwater use. In agrarian economies like India, Pakistan and Bangladesh, agriculture has the biggest demand for water. This is followed by industries, power consumption and domestic use. So what are the factors that deprive South Asians of the right to water? Water bureaucracy, in simple words, mismanagement of water by the government leading to poor allocation. Water contamination due to untested effluence from domestic and industrial sources. And absolute water shortage caused by rainfall deficit. And these have led to loss of life. What source of conflict in South Asia? Pakistan recently approached the World Bank after India threatened to review the 56-year-old Indus Waters Treaty. The sharing of Ganges waters has been a source of conflict between India and Pakistan, especially after India built a dam that diverts the water to India. With the Kabul River flowing between Afghanistan and Pakistan, experts are calling for a water-sharing treaty between the two countries. Sharing of water between countries uh, typically upstream states like uh, India and Pakistan. So in that case, it's India which is the upstream state or with Bangladesh also India is the upstream state. Typically, uh, we tend to withhold more than our share of water. Even within India, if you look, the kind of sharing agreements that we've got between states are, have been kind of skewed towards the upstream states. Lack of monsoon has led to devastating droughts in parts of India and Pakistan. According to reports, 116 farmers committed suicide in India in the first three months of 2016. Unfortunately, social factors like gender and caste also determine the right to water in the subcontinent. For example, women typically get water for household uses, while men get it for agriculture and irrigation. People from the lower caste often get poorer quality of water, while the upper caste people get better quality water which may be more perennial in nature. In New Delhi, I'm Shailaja Varma for Vion. Now, access to safe drinking water is often taken for granted in the developed world. But that isn't always the case. In the American town of Flint, Michigan, cost-cutting measures led to a tainted drinking water scandal. The crisis has exposed tens and thousands of children to permanent health issues. Vion's Mandy Clark looks at the Flint case and the dangers of putting economy over public health. Why are there medical records and blood samples in real estate files? 
In the movie Aaron Brockovich, one woman takes on a crooked energy company that has poisoned a California town's drinking water. So it kills people. Based on a true story, the iconic film is a warning about putting profit before people, but not everyone took note. My sweat, my time away from my kids, if that's not personal! Located in the state of Michigan, 70 miles north of Detroit, you'll find the town of Flint. Population 98,310, where 41.6% of residents live below the poverty line, and 56.6% of residents are African American. It's here where it seems dollars were chosen over lives. You have a minority population saying this isn't right, who would drink this water? And they were viewed as, uh, as complainers or, or, or troublemakers, you know, or people that didn't understand. No, of course they understood. No one would drink tainted water. Well, the crisis actually happened two years ago when the state of Michigan looked at the town's finances and saw a projected $25 million deficit. Now, at the time, Flint was getting its water from Detroit. There was a plan in the future to switch supplies to Lake Huron, but that wasn't ready just yet. So in order to save money, they decided to get the water from the Flint River which was heavily polluted and found to be 19 times more corrosive than lake water. After the switch, water started coming out of the taps yellow and the health authority found dangerous levels of lead in the water. The water was not treated properly to stop the leaching of lead from old underground pipes. For young children in particular, when their nervous system is developing, their brain's developing, this is, uh, this is, extra critical because it's a time when uh, they're, they're more vulnerable. Children exposed to high levels of lead can suffer a decreased IQ, behavioral issues, and hearing problems. But it took a year and a half and mass pressure from activists, doctors, and scientists for the town to return to its old water supply. President Barack Obama gave $5 million in aid for state emergency funding. And now several officials face criminal charges for tampering with water quality tests. Last week, the town had a bit of good news. The U.S. Senate passed a bill to fund the removal of lead-tainted pipes. The $170 million will be used to replace the more than 29,000 lead lines. The question is now. Can we hope that history will not repeat itself? Mandy Clark, We On, London. We're going to take a short break now. When we return, more on the right to water and how we can secure it and the challenges going forward. Democracy and Dictatorship, presented by Shkoda. Simply clever. Welcome back to Democracy and Dictatorship. Joining us now is Meena Narula. She is the country director in India for the organization Water for People. Also joining us is Himanshu Thakkar. He's the coordinator with South Asia Network on dams, rivers, and people. Thank you both for joining us. Let me start by asking you, Himanshu, how large is this challenge? 50% of India's population, where you're based, lacks access to water. Yeah, see, we need to understand that where does our water come from first? And uh, what is the state of that resource? So, you know, 85% of the rural population on Indi in India depend on groundwater. More than 55% of the even urban population depends on groundwater. More than 60% of the industrial water supply comes from groundwater. More than two-thirds of our irrigation water comes from groundwater. So groundwater is one resource which is a lifeline, water lifeline of India. That's one thing we need to understand. But the way we are using that resource is most unsustainable. See, groundwater comes from recharge and we are using more water than the recharge is happening. So the levels are going down, the quality is deteriorating. Our industries sometimes because they don't want to treat the polluted water and they, do, they don't want to release it because they will get caught, they actually pump that toxic mix into the groundwater. 
and polluting the whole area permanently. This is happening and the pollution control boards knows that. So basically, and, but more importantly, it's the, our use is so much more because we are not doing anything to regulate the use. For example, we are growing sugarcane in Marathawada, which is a drought prone area and that sugarcane then we are subsidizing to export. So we are exporting huge quantity of water which should be not even available to the farmers there. Right. Meena, talking about access to this clean drinking water, yeah. explain to me how large is this challenge for India, South Asia and then the world? Yeah, yeah I think you know um, children are very dear to my heart and uh, you know as we speak we lose one child under five years uh, you know every single minute and uh, 60 percent of these deaths can be saved if we have access to safe drinking water and sanitation facilities so that's the kind of a problem and you know if you were to just accumulate it in india itself you know the economic burden because of this is about 600 uh, us dollars every 600 million single, us dollars 600 million us dollars every single year because of people falling sick people yes. not having access to water yes and it's all preventable and uh, it's preventable because one it's about uh, you know ensuring equitable availability of water but it's also about safe hygiene practices you know and uh, those are possible only if we are able to ensure that we have water in every school every health clinic and every community is able to have access to safe drinking water now well, let's talk a bit about the river systems you talked about rivers are our main reach out systems you go across this country anywhere it's not possible to even stand next to most rivers they're so highly polluted there is untreated sewage if it goes through industrial areas there's untreated chemical pollutants being pumped into these rivers what are we not understanding i've been to even countries like afghanistan where you won't find a piece of paper lying in the water system how backward are we when we are talking about dealing with our rivers ironically india is a country which rivers worships its rivers more than any other country in the world our prayers our festivals our scriptures are all full of uh, rivers you know how we need to value our rivers but if you look at the way we are treating our rivers it's most abysmal Recently, we organized, some of our organizations organized India Rivers Week, the second one uh, in, at the end of November. And what we found through an assessment across India is that 70% of India's rivers are already in red category, which means they are polluted severely. And how does this happen? What happens? The basically, because see, our water river pollution, uh, you know, the way we tackle is, it, the effort started 42 years back through 1974 Water Pollution Act. And through that whole bureaucracy was set up. The State Pollution Control Board, the Central Pollution Control Board, the laboratories and so on. I have been asking this bureaucracy for last several decades now. Give me one example. One example where this pollution control bureaucracy has been able to achieve a single clean stream of river or stream or river, a single one. Nowhere, no success story. The pollution control mechanism is firstly, that whole mechanism is completely unaccountable, non-transparent and refuses to have any participatory management. Then you also look at the stark example is what happens in close where we are in Delhi, the national capital. Absolutely. And look at what the Delhi does to the Yamuna, the one of the biggest rivers of India. In fact, Yamuna is bigger than Ganga where they meet. Okay. That bigger river, Delhi is the one which which the stretch is only 2%, but that 2% stretch completely destroys the river. I've been covering this story for over a decade and a half now. And if you actually see what happens to Yamuna in Delhi, where the river becomes a drain and the drain becomes a river, yeah. uh, it's surprising. Uh, a lot of that has been talked about, people have said, oh, we don't have a good sewage system. But is it really the STP, the sewage treatment plants, which are the issue? What's going wrong here? The basic fault, I think, is because we are not ready to address the governance of this pollution control mechanism, whether it's a sewage or it's industrial. And when, we, when I say governance, what we need to really have is a deep democracy 
in water in governance of this whole thing why is it not possible who is responsible for the stp out of new delhi for example delhi jal board is responsible for its functioning and why cannot its leadership be sued for not delivering a clean output can you believe since 1994 a supreme court case no less than supreme court is handling a case on yamuna which is called meli yamuna that case is going on since 94 but even our judiciary has so abysmally failed you know judiciary it is all the powers in the the act environment pollution uh, protection act of 1986 and even the water pollution act of 74 has sufficient powers to book the people who are responsible for non functioning of stps for dumping untreated water into the its sewage into and they could have given you know deadlines even the supreme court has not been able to handle it i think the whole system you know all arms of our uh, governance has uh, uh, failed completely in uh, really including civil society media and uh, the democracy we are talking about access as to water as a basic fundamental human right yeah how important is it to make sure that it's implemented I think um, uh, if we just look at the the sustainable development goals to whom you know we all are committed to, you know I'm pretty hopeful because you know it's 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 kind of all encompassing. You know the sustainable development goals this time not only talk about access to safe drinking water and sanitation. You know uh, they are also talking about water use efficiency. They are also talking about quality. The uh, the you know the community is being aware. of the water that they are consuming you know leading to so many health issues etc you know it's also talking about local capacity building it's also talking about placing ownership amongst the communities so you know at water for people you know just to give you an example we work with about 182 gram panchayats our clear focus is on ensuring that yes there is access to water and we provide for that but more importantly are the communities able to operate manage and sustain these systems over a period of time or not and you know some of these have actually led to you know Im- improved uh, economic levels amongst the communities because they are managing these water sources you know they are introducing a tariff system so nothing comes for free and when people are paying for it they maintain it they manage it let's compare to a little different society let's say let's look at a society where it functions that means a democracy functions where people understand who's responsible for what there is a system in place can we look at an example of let's say sweden for example of how they manage their water or another country which manages its water well can we look at something yeah, there are number of uh, uh, you know lessons one can learn from other countries also you know for example uk the state of the rivers was you know it it, it was so stinking that the parliament smelled that river and then they woke up and then that was in late 60s and since then they have worked on it and thames is one of the cleanest rivers now that passes near the parliament us till ni- late 1960s again they said their rivers could burn there so much pollutants but the the fresh water act of 1972 change things significantly and after that now if you go to rivers uh, i mean us most rivers are in reasonably such a state you can straight away drink water so the germany i went i saw that bonn for example they have been reducing their water consumption a city whose population is increasing the water consumption is reducing so this is there are many exam even in india she gave an example if you go to hirve bazar in maharashtra or you go to uh, uh, samadhiyala village in saurashtra rajkot there are number of communities when they manage their rivers and sources water well uh, you go to alwar tarun bharat sang what they did number of places where where people have started managing their own water resources they have actually achieved not only success but prosperity let's take a quick break now more on the other side about how water is handled globally Democracy and dictatorship, presented by Shkora, simply clever. Welcome back to the show. We've been talking with Meena Narula and Himanshu Thakkar about the right to water and how the lack of it is affecting the functioning of our societies. Uh, Himanshu, let's talk a bit more about 
globally? How, what is the state, where does the world stand today when it comes to access to clean water? Uh, see, there one thing is that uh, rivers, for example, the way the world is treating rivers has significantly changed in last few decades. Uh, US, for example, in last two and a half decades has decommissioned more than 1000 dams, meaning the dams which were already built have been removed so that the rivers flow, so that the fish can continue to survive and the biodiversity can survive in the rivers. So, the, this is a fallout of the clean water and value for the rivers and so on. In Europe, in Netherlands for example, there is a movement called room for the river. In South Korea, they have demolished flyovers and malls in the city so that the river flows because earlier they encroached on the river, but they said that was wrong. So, they wanted to remove those encroachment that demolished those structures so that the river continues to flow. Similarly, things have happened in even places like Morocco and number of other places. So, the world is beginning to understand that the water is not just a commodity, it is part of the ecosystem on which the survival of the humanity and large sections of the people depend. Now, let us talk about the treaties of access to clean water. Is there a global model for it? The UN in a way through the sustainable development goals, you know, they have certainly uh, kind of placed it as a development agenda. So, it may, it may not be a regulatory, uh, you know, a rule or a law that has been placed, but they certainly place that as an important development agenda for the countries to take charge of it. Uh, if I just look at the Indian context, you know, the national flagship programs and, you know, the setting up of the state water and sanitation commissions, you know, right down till the block level. I think those are some of the efforts in, uh, in this regard that, uh, you know, there is um, access to safe drinking water, not only in terms of access, but I think we specifically talk about water quality monitoring, you know, making the governments aware of uh, areas where there is an issue of water quality, making communities aware of water points which have a water quality issue. You know, there is so much of emphasis now on roof rainwater harvesting, for That's example, true. in terms of conserving traditional sources of water, you know, and I think these are some of the steps in the same direction. For a country of India's size, 1.3 billion people, that's 1,300 million people, it's almost impossible to start controlling. I think it has to be democratized in a way where people recognize that this is something my generations need and I need to protect it. The ability to have that ownership is missing. How does one change that? Beyond that, how does one then ensure that the governance runs properly? Yeah. It's still a mystery. Actually, uh, you are right, but it is not that complicated also. You know, for example, groundwater, where does it come from? It comes from aquifers. Aquifer is essentially a localized resource. And so, aquifer management is possible only at the local level. So, basic literacy of the resource will tell you that management of this resource can only happen where it resides. And that can happen only with the people who are using that. So, unless you have a management system which gives the right of management and monitoring and control of that resource to the people who are using it and do it through a legally empowered mechanism, institutionalized mechanism, you can do that. If you do that, then whole mystery gets very simple. Then the recharge also happens locally. The demand is local, the use is local and the management is local. If you deepen the democracy and start at the bottom, it has to be bottom up, not top down. Right. If you start doing that, whether it is groundwater management, whether it is pollution management, whether it is river management, whether it is irrigation management, every one of the mystery will be solved. Uh, we have heard this many times around the world. The next war will not be about land, won't be about energy, but will be about water. water. How true is that? Ina, you want to take that? Uh. I hope it doesn't happen <laughs> and I hope we take charge of uh, the situation much before that uh, uh, situation really arises. 
I mean, I can, you know, uh, again speak from uh, example from, uh, you know, Water for People. We work across nine countries, you know, and where, uh, you know, we've really, really tried to look at communities taking charge. You know, two, two strategies which have really worked is, you know, making communities aware and allowing them to take charge of their local resources. I think that's one thing which has really worked. And, uh, you know, as Himanshu is mentioning, you know, it's really a bottom-up approach and, you know, therefore local governance and the district administrations, etc., you know, become more accountable and likewise in other countries, the structures which exist. And uh, the second, uh, you know, most important is we are young, we are a young population. So how do you really catch them young? How do you educate children? I think that's really, really, uh, you know, uh, an area we need to work on. Your closing thoughts, uh, Himanshu, on how is the world going to manage? See, I think the, the, uh, there are a lot of lessons available in front of us. And the best way forward is that we really, your, you know, your uh, uh, program is about democracy. I think the key is to deepen the democracy in governance of water. Yeah. If we start doing it, we will really m move uh, toward the solution. Thank you very much both Thank for you. joining us. The importance of water as a building block for stable societies is obvious. Hence, the right to water is a human right that cannot be denied any longer. Developmental goals need to be aligned to secure access to clean water for drinking and agriculture. Access will decide democratization of resources, but nothing is absolute. Democracy and Dictatorship, presented by Shkora. Simply clever.